Hey everybody, this is Eric. We're back for video number one of our advanced hemodynamics series. We're going to dive into advanced hemodynamics. We're going to do this in a lecture format. Um, I'm excited about this. We're going to do probably four or five uh, videos based on this, kind of make these shorter videos. There's a lot of information, and I really want you to understand the concepts of advanced hemodynamics. This is a big aspect of critical care medicine. If you've come from an ICU background where you've monitored swans and, and, and balloon pumps and things like that, then you, you're a step ahead. Uh, come in and join us. Uh, look at this from the perspective of the HEMS industry, transport medicine, and I hope you get a lot out of it. Leave your comments, email me if you have any questions. I'll put all the links in the bottom of the show notes, and we'll see you inside. Thank you. Hey everybody, this is Eric back with you with uh, Flatbridge Ed. I just wanted to welcome you to our uh, first video on advanced hemodynamics. We're going to do probably a four-part series on advanced hemodynamics, and um, we'll just have to see how things go. Uh, I want to try to keep these videos under 30 minutes. Uh, I know everybody's time is uh, valuable, so keep it under 30 minutes. I think that fosters a better learning environment as well. So let's jump in and get started. Today what we're going to start off, we're just going to go into the basics of setting up the monitoring system. Um, this video probably will be 15 minutes or so. So we'll just touch on this. Uh, then video number two is going to be on the actual central lines, swans, pulmonary artery catheters, the different ports, uh, understanding what those ports are, what they're, what they're used for, and the different issues that you could see um, by maybe using the wrong port. So we'll discuss also in that video number two uh, aspects of how you can apply that to your patients, and then we'll look at a few little test taking tips if you're looking to take your advanced certification exams like your FPC, your CFRN, um, things like that. So when you uh, set up a fluid monitoring system, what we're essentially doing is we're setting up a system that is going to make um, our, let's say, SWAN, um, a, a dynamic system. So we want a dynamic system. We want to flow fluid through this system, and we, we're trying to transduce a waveform. So that's the purpose of this system. So whether you use this with a balloon pump, um, catheter or you're using this with uh, let's say a swan that's placed into the the IJ or the subclavian we have to have some type of a system that's going to allow that fluid to flow appropriately so we have to have a few simple things we have to have one bag of normal saline LR it doesn't really matter what you're using as far as which fluid um, normal saline is probably the most common you're going to need a pressure bag and you're just going to need your pressure tubing and that pressure tubing is going to be specific to your monitor um, a lot of aircrafts around the country will, will carry multiple sets based on the area that they fly in so just know that um, you need to have the correct pressure tubing that's going to be associated with your monitor when we set this up, it's really, really important to understand that we have to make sure we get all the air out of the system. Um, we need to, um, you know, spike our bag. When we spike our bag, we need to make sure that um, we spike it and we fill that drip chamber all the way up. There's no need to uh, have any air or anything in that drip chamber. Fill it all the way up with fluid and then really flush that line out. I mean, excessively flush it out. Make sure you have no air. And I'll explain why in the next few slides. So here's a picture on the right of a uh, normal saline bag that's in a, a, a pressure bag. We have our pressure tubing. Um, we have our transducer. You can see that transducer is right there in the center. And then we have the line that comes all the way down. We have our stopcock there at the very bottom. And then you can see at the top right our green, or excuse me, our gray cable. And that's what's hooking to your monitor. That's what's giving you the signal when you transduce this. So like I said, the fluid fill system is used to deliver a controlled amount of fluid. It's used to deliver two to three cc's per hour. So imagine, that's a really small amount of fluid. Um, we're, we're putting pressure against the normal saline. We're filling that bag up and we're only filling that bag up to squeeze on the normal saline bag to 300 millimeters of mercury. So what we're trying to do again is uh, transmit a signal to transduce a waveform, and the primary waveform that you're gonna see, uh, especially if you have a swan, is you're gonna be looking at a pulmonary artery waveform. Now, if you're using this system and you, you have this hooked to just a normal central line, you can transduce a normal central line and just see a CVP waveform. But primarily for transport, if you're gonna be doing this, you're gonna be looking at some type of pulmonary artery waveform. 
Now, something to, to also say, if you're flying balloon pumps or if you're transporting balloon pumps and this is set up with an association uh, with that balloon pump being placed, then the tip of that balloon pump is actually looking at the aortic valve closing. And when we look at dissecting the different waveforms in video number three of this series, um, that'll be very important because we have to distinguish between what type of pulmonary artery waveform are we looking at. Um, or I should say, what type of art line waveform are we looking at? Not pulmonary artery waveform. What type of art line waveform are we looking at? Are we looking at the pulmonary artery, the dichrotic notch on the pulmonary artery that's uh, uh, indicative of pulmonic valve closure? Or are we looking at the aortic valve closing based on the balloon pump looking up at that aortic valve? So again, two to cc fluid uh, cc's per hour is what we're wanting to uh, see. So when we set this up, again, we get all the air out. A good way to do it is actually spike the bag and then pull the drip set back out. Um, squeeze all the air back out and then re-spike it. That's something that's worked well for me. Um, then flip it back uh, vertical and fill that drip chamber all the way up. Place it into your pressure bag and then you want to inflate that, like I said, to 300 millimeters of mercury. Now, if you've never noticed on your pressure bags, if you inflate that and you'll see the little green um, plunger come up and you can see at the picture on the bottom that that plunger when you lose the the green and you start seeing red come out that is the indication that you've hit that 300 millimeters of mercury and those pressure bags are set up to where they're never gonna allow you to inflate past that they'll actually equalize that pressure that's the maximum pressure they're supposed to hold so 300 millimeters of mercury pump it all the way up till you start seeing the red turn the stopcock towards the, the bag, so vertical, um, pointing vertical, and that's going to shut off so you don't have any leakage. And then at that point, make sure everything's flushed, everything, there's no air, there's no kinks, uh, anything like that. So once we hook this to our patient, there's a few things we need to discuss. The first term we need to discuss is called a phlebostatic axis. And there's going to be a picture here and a few slides that will represent that. So I'm going to kind of uh, discuss that in more depth. But that phlebostatic axis is where the transducer, and that's the picture at the top right, that's where we tape that. That transducer has to be taped fourth to fifth intercostal place, uh, mid axillary line. And essentially what you're doing is you're placing that in a direct plane that, that looks straight through and separates the atriums from the ventricles. So that's a straight plane all the way through. And we need to make sure that that transducer that you see is perfectly leveled based on how the patient's laying. So if the patient is laying head elevated 15 degrees, we need to make sure that that transducer is not pointing downward, that we level it back out. If you have a patient that has possibly an arm injury, a traumatic injury where they can't move their arms so you can't place this transducer, you can't tape it to their, the side of their chest, then you can actually tape it to their bicep. Every time your patient moves, this transducer um, is very susceptible to and sensitive to barometric pressure changes. So if you change an altitude, if even if you go up a couple flights of stairs, or I should say in the elevator stories, um, you need to do what's called a fast flush, we'll discuss that here in a second, and re-zero that monitor. And we do that because it's got to equalize and reset based on the current pressure that you're at based on the elevation. A change in placement will definitely change your, your values. And so that's why we always want to re-zero that for any patient move. And that's a common test question when you take these advanced certification exams. With every patient move, you re-zero your monitor, you do a fast flush um, and re-zero your monitor and it will reset itself. So when we look at that phlebostatic axis, fourth intercostal space, um, a transducer needs to be sitting perfectly level. If it's too high or if it's too low, you're gonna get a false uh, waveform, false reading. So we have to remember that um, taking the extra time to make sure this is level, make sure it's taped correctly, um, kind of, uh, make sure that the patient isn't sitting up too far. Remember, patients should always be transported with head elevated a little bit, especially if they're innovated, unless it's a trauma patient, obviously, and they're on a, C a long spine board. But head elevated at least 15 degrees for, for most of our patients, um, again, 
you don't want any risk for aspiration. And even if they're innovated, you're going to have microvascular leakage around that ET tube uh, cuff, and that will cause um, a uh, some type of a pneumonia could cause an infection of some sort. So it's just best as far as being that patient advocate and having them head elevated at least 15 degrees. The things you want to be aware of though in, in those situations, especially with patients that are being uh, monitored with a, with a swan, if they have a balloon pump in, is the swan actually placed in the femoral vein? Because you know that's that's how they place those at times. Most often though, and I'll talk about this in more depth in video number two, they're placed actually in the IJ or the subclavian. But you can imagine if your patient is sitting up too far, it's going to cause a kink in your uh, where your hip intersects with your femur at that ad acetabulum. So that's going to kink that catheter. So that's why we never want the patient head elevated too far, especially in these in these scenarios. So remember, you're going to secure that. You're going to open it to air. That's the that little. Uh, uh, stop clock, you're going to open it to air and you're going to do a fast flush with that pigtail and then you're going to re-zero your monitor. What are we doing when we do that? Well, <clears throat> we're actually, if you look at this plane, this is the plane, this is that fourth, fifth intercostal space and if you can imagine the heart being uh, a direct plane. So essentially if we cut this guy and we lifted his chest off, we're looking at a direct plane that separates the right and left atrium from the right and left ventricle. So we're just lifting off those two atrial areas and we're, we're have a direct plane going through. So in this patient laying supine, we would want this completely level. If we sat him up, we would want to turn it and level it based on, you know, how he's laying. If uh, you had a trauma patient, like, like I said, if you have an arm injury where they can't lift their arm up, a shoulder injury, then you may need to secure that with uh, tape on his bicep. Okay, so when we look at how this system is dynamic, so we've set it up, we're, uh, we're flowing, we, uh, we're trying now to transduce a waveform, we want to make sure that that waveform is perfect. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, like I said, we want two to three cc's per hour. Um, that is an indication of a perfectly dynamic system. That's going to give you a good transduced waveform. And so what we're looking for, and this is a term you're going to see a lot in test taking when you do your critical care um, uh, certifications, whether it's CFRN, CCRN, FPC, is a term called damping. And damping basically is the, the, how sensitive that system is. So a normal dampened waveform would be uh, A there. So this is an observed normal waveform. And this waveform, and don't worry about what it is at this point, but it's a PA waveform and we are looking at it, we don't want it too wide, we don't want it too narrow, okay? We want it nice and crisp, we want to be able to identify the dichrotic notch very, very easily, and when you actually pull that pigtail, so you're gonna open it to air, you're gonna pull that pigtail, you're gonna do a fast flush, um, and at that point, you're gonna have the, see this system become dynamic, and so this fast flush, we have a waveform, the waveform is, is flowing along, we do the fast flush, and that's where you see that sudden spike all the way up, it peaks, that's that expected square waveform test, and then it comes back down and it goes back into a pulmonary artery waveform um, just normally. So when we look at the other terms that are abnormal, the other abnormal, uh, or the two abnormal uh, damping waveforms that you're gonna see, I should say, are a over dampened waveform and an under dampened waveform. So let's look at an over dampened waveform. An over dampened waveform is something that you should always think of what's blocking the system. I always think of it and, and relate it to EKG interpretation. And when we see an ideoventricular rhythm, when we see a really wide QRS complex, there's obviously some type of block in the ventricle that's causing that impulse from um, manifesting itself in the right way. The depolarization is not adequate enough. And so I always think of it and relate it to that. Now, obviously you're gonna to have to relate it to however you remember things. But in this circumstance, think of it as you have a blocked system. So the system, if you do a fast flush, is gonna be very slow. So this is over damped. It's a very slow response. So you can see if you compare A to B, um, A, you, you pulled that pigtail, you flushed that system, 
Um, and, and that pigtail, when you pull it, man, I mean, you, sh you can shoot um, fluid out for 15 feet. I mean, it really, really moves fast because you can remember we have 300 millimeters of mercury that is uh, squeezing down on that normal saline bag. So there's a lot of pressure exerted against that. Well, in B, if you look at that, we do a fast flush. Uh, it comes up. We have that square waveform test, but then we don't have a return. It doesn't bounce correctly, and it comes, it's very sluggish. It comes down very slowly, and we just have this lackadaisical waveform. And there's some waveforms that, that we'll see later on uh, in module four where they're really, really widened out. They almost look flat. So remember, an over dampened waveform means you have a block in your system. And then lastly, you're under damping. Under damping means that you have a very hyperdynamic system. That means that you have something that's causing an increase in pressure. Remember, we have 300 millimeters of mercury exerted against that system. That's supposed to flow two to three cc's per hour. If you have air in the system, air is, is something that's gonna cause a, uh, more pressure. And so more pressure in that system is gonna cause a hyperdynamic state. So you can see this waveform just even before we even flush this, you should be able to identify that this waveform is very abnormal. You don't have good crisp um, slurring type uh, uh, characteristics, I should say. And so that should be your first clue. Second clue is when you do that fast flush, we come up, we have that expected square waveform, and then we come back down and you can see that we have excessive bouncing. Um, very, very rapid, and we have a very high, crisp uh, waveform that doesn't look normal. So that is an underdamped waveform. That means that you have air in the system, um, and you need to try to occlude or uh, fix that. Or obviously, flush that out, and make sure that you uh, fix that. Very, very important because again, we want to make sure we can transduce a waveform that we get a good waveform, a good pulmonary artery systolic and diastolic number because that's very, very important. We'll discuss that again in, in video number three. Very important to see this and, and understand how can I fix this, understand the terminology. Um, and really it's very simple. Either you have a blockage or you have air. If you have a blockage, look, look at your equipment, make sure you don't have a kink, you don't have something that's pinched off. And then air, you know, air is something that you can usually fix by flushing your system really, really well. As far as air in the system, again, take the time when you're setting this up and, and give yourself the opportunity to uh, not have this happen during transport. Get all the air out, take the extra minute or so to do uh, a good job getting the air out uh, so you're not having to fight it all the time. And I see this all the time while setting up just normal IV lines to pumps, you know, rushing through it and then you're having air messages, air uh, alarms going off the whole flight. Um, and that's pretty counterproductive when you when you think about uh, giving a medication that may be uh, needed. So that's all I have for this video. This is, a, like I said, a very quick down and dirty uh, look at the actual pressure monitoring system. And um, we will hopefully see you on video number two. Like I said, don't miss it. All about the swan. Talk about central lines. Talk about all the different ports. Um, good stuff. And then once we finish video number two, we're going to get into the really neat aspects of waveform uh, physiology, what all that means, how we can apply that. And then video number four, we're going to start looking at um, blood pressures. We're going to start looking at blood pressures in comparison to your pulmonary artery systolic and diastolic, what that means. Um, and how to fix those issues. Do we have a pump failure? Do we have a, uh, a cardiomyopathy? Do we have a dilated cardiomyopathy where we need to optimize um, filling and clearing? So all those things that kind of go into treating our patients. And we all know that that's the most important. We can learn all this stuff, but how do we apply all this to our patient care? And that's my big passion. How do you apply all this to our patient care in a way that's easy to understand and easy to remember um, and so that is what we're all about. I want to thank you again. Uh, share this with your friends. Um, comment on it. That's how we learn. That's how we collaborate. Um, we both become smarter by that. I want to hear your comments, and we will talk to you soon.